Hey guys, so um, I'm going to talk to you this morning about a, a question that was posed on one of my previous videos. So a couple weeks back I did a video over specialty gases. I talked about hyperbaric oxygen, I talked about uh, heliox, and I talked about inhaled nitric oxide. And that's, that led to this question that I'm going to answer now which is uh, in reference to the nitric oxide portion of it, which was t talked about to treat pulmonary hypertension. And so the question comes from Maria. I'm not sure where Maria works, but this is what impresses me about Maria. This, this channel, as most of you know, is for um, learning RTs, stu students primarily in, in school. So RT students is what a lot of this content is put out for. And a lot of the questions that I answer are directed towards and come from RT students, but there's a handful of licensed respiratory care practitioners that are still continuing to learn, and they can continue to uh, watch these videos and engage themselves with them and say, hey, can you answer how that, what you just said, how does that apply to this, which is a step up from the basic information? And so uh, I give big kudos to Maria because she's one of these continual learners, which is probably the, the, the best tool you can put in your bag as a, as a current respiratory therapist or a soon-to-be respiratory therapist is to never stop learning and understanding these concepts. And then on top of that, Maria also sets out to enhance the care delivered in her facility to her patients by educating her coworkers. She gets involved with skills fairs and stuff like that to, to drive home some of these concepts that are often forgotten post-graduation. And, and, and that's the key, guys. That's the key to a successful career as a respiratory therapist. You go out there and go through the motions, and you're going to find yourself complacent and not really enjoying your job and just, just doing it. But when you go out there and you continue to learn and understand greater concepts and apply basic theories to more challenging situations then things start to come alive and you really start enjoying what you're doing and you enjoy your job so kudos to maria here's maria's question it was that there's a there's a, a well-respected physician in her facility who claims that every patient on mechanical ventilation has some sort some level of pulmonary hypertension okay and then so the question is is how can you explain that and then on top of that, are there certain modes of mechanical ventilation that will cause a greater level of pulmonary hypertension than others? So I'm going to finish with that. First, we're going to talk about pulmonary hypertension. And we're really going to just talk about hypertension in general, okay? And then we're going to go into pulmonary hypertension. So to understand hypertension, we're talking about the circulatory system or we're talking about an increase in blood pressure above what normal is for whatever portion of the circulatory system you're talking about, okay? So you understand that. Uh, getting into hemodynamics here, that the right ventricle's pressure is different than the left ventricle's pressure, and the pulmonary capillaries have a different pressure than the pulmonary artery, and that's the way it's supposed to work, okay? Now, when any of those pressures increase, well, we call that hypertension. So what would cause, in general, hypertension? And there's three primary things. I'm not going to say there's not anything else, okay? But these are the three primary things when you think about the circulatory system. A closed-loop pump. Okay, just like the one in your car. Okay, it's, it's a pump that's pushing fluid around through a system. Okay, and it's using pressure gradients to push it. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is vasoconstriction. Okay, if any of these vessels inside of the circulatory system constrict and get smaller, then that will increase the pressure in that region. Okay, so you will have hypertension from the vasoconstriction. Okay, it just makes sense, right? If you have a closed pump, think about your sprinkler system in your yard or if you, if you know anything about sprinkler systems. The further away from the pump that, that the sprinkler heads get, you have to dial down and use smaller piping. Why? To maintain that pressure. Why? Because smaller pipes equal greater pressure. Okay, the pump is pressuring is, is the same. So to increase the pressure a long ways away from the pump, you have to use smaller pipes. It's the same way our body works. Think about it. You have the great vessels, and the further away the vessels get from the heart, the smaller the vessels get. And that's all because you have to have those smaller vessels to maintain pressure. 
and to circulate the blood flow as in a normal fashion. Okay, so if they get even smaller than what they normally are, which is vasoconstriction, then pressure goes up. Okay, the second thing is compression. Okay, any type of compression on a vessel will cause pressure to go up. Okay, that makes sense. If you think about a water balloon, if you squeeze it, pressure goes up, right? If you think about a water hose, you got water running through it. If you kink it or compress it, pressure goes up, right? Same thing within the human body, the circulatory system. Any compression of any vessel will cause pressure to increase prior to that compression level, okay? And then the last one is increased fluid. If you increase the amount of fluid in the circulatory system, pressure will go up. This is why we, why we bolus people in emergency situations. You have a patient that's hypotensive, what do they do? Bolus. Hang a, hang a liter of fluid, right? Maybe hang two or three liters. They try to increase the fluid. You put more fluid into a closed system pump, pressure goes up. Okay, if pressure goes up above normal, then now we're talking hypertension. Okay, now you can put obstruction on here also, obviously in cases like, um, you know, if you have an obstruction of any of your uh, any of your vessels or pipes, then pressure goes up. Okay, that obviously makes sense prior to, if you go back prior to the, the obstruction. Okay. Past the obstruction, pressure goes down, obviously. But we're not even going to talk about that. These are the three main that I want to talk about today. Now, once we understand this, we understand that these three things apply to all vessels. Okay, so now let's talk specifically about pulmonary capillaries. Because when we talk about pulmonary hypertension, we're talking about an increased pressure in the pulmonary capillaries. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about why... A patient on mechanical ventilation, because the statement was all patients on mechanical ventilation have some level of pulmonary hypertension. So what mechanisms are happening when a patient is on mechanical ventilation that could cause all of these patients to have pulmonary hypertension? Okay, and we can relate it back to all three of these. Okay, so let's just talk about the first one, vasoconstriction. Pulmonary vasoconstriction occurs during times of hypoxia, so if you have pulmonary hypoxia of regions that aren't getting enough oxygen, then those pulmonary capillaries will vasoconstrict. Also, if they're not well ventilated and it leads to an acidosis, they will vasoconstrict. Okay. Now, when we talk about this, we're talking about areas of the lungs that may not be ventilated adequately. So now we're getting in the proper vent settings where we're talking about maybe tidal volumes that are too small um, and we don't have good ventilation throughout all areas of the lungs. This would cause regional hypoxia in a regional area of hypoventilation, which could lead to pulmonary vasoconstriction. And in that area, those pressures would go up, right? Pulmonary hypertension in those regions, okay? Now, the second one here is compression. If you think about what happens when we normally breathe, so me and you right now watching this video, I'm assuming nobody on events watching this. Okay, so everybody's breathing spontaneously, our diaphragm drops, we get this negative intrathoracic pull, the lungs inflate and they deflate. Okay, now with that negative pull, that negative pressure that's created inside the thoracic cavity, as respiratory therapists, we think about it as, oh, that's how the alveoli expand. Air is drawn in, and they expand, and that's true. But we oftentimes fail to really grasp that that negative pull also plays a role on the vessels inside the thoracic cavity. That negative pull, when the diaphragm drop, actually enhances and improves blood flow through the pulmonary circulation, okay? So we forget that concept a lot, actually. And so the negative pull from a spontaneous breath plays two roles. Obviously allows for lung expansion to happen, but also enhances pulmonary blood flow during that time with the negative pull. It's just like sucking on a straw. If you suck on a straw, negative pressure, fluid comes in quicker, right? That's exactly the harder you pull, the more you'll suck, the more fluid you'll get. Same with spontaneous breathing. So it plays a role also that negative pressure in the intrathoracic negative pressure during spontaneous breathing also plays a role in optimal performance of Cardio, cardio, 
pulmonary circulation. Okay. Now, when we take that away and we go into a positive pressure style of mechanical ventilation, then now we're exerting pressure onto the alveoli. Secondarily, it is increasing intrathoracic pressure. Okay, now we're no longer operating off of negative intrathoracic pressure. Now we're operating off of positive intrathoracic pressure. And the vent is pushing air via positive pressure into the lungs. This compresses all vessels inside the intrathoracic cavity, including the pulmonary capillaries. Now, I know you're thinking like, nah, like it's not that big of a deal. Well, it may not be so great of a compression that you have decreased venous return, but you still have some level of additional pressure being exerted inside the intrathoracic pressure cavity, which is compressing pulmonary capillaries and other pulmonary vessels. Okay? You, it just makes sense, right? So that in itself is going to provide some level of pulmonary hypertension just from the positive pressure compressing on the pulmonary capillaries. Increased pulmonary hypertension. And then the last thing is, and this doesn't have anything really to do with mechanical ventilation. This has more to do with my, most of our patients own mechanical ventilation are in critical condition and in an ICU. And very few ICU patients from a fluid standpoint, you would look at and say that very few of them are ever not several liters positive on their eyes and nose. They, they oftentimes are, are hypervolemic. Okay. Remember, if we put more fluid in the system, pressures go up all the way around the board, that's going to lead to some level of pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so, so those are the three components. Now, if you ask me, of those three, what do I think the doc's theory is and why he says every patient on mechanical ventilation has um, some level of pulmonary hypertension, I'm going to go that if I had to choose one, I'm going to go with that. He probably thinks, he, his theory is probably rooted in the idea of the positive pressure compression of the vessels. Okay, this is secondary. It may, it may be any one of these, I don't know. Um, but my, my thought process is probably his mindset is compression related. Okay, this can go even, even deeper. You even get a greater level of compression if your tidal volumes are too high. So think about this, tidal volumes are too low, you get regional uh, hypoventilation, and that can lead to vasoconstriction. On the flip side, if tidal volumes are too high and you get overstretching of the alveoli, then you have even a greater level of compression happening that can lead to pulmonary hypertension, which is so, it's, it makes sense why it's so important that we're using adequate tidal volumes, appropriate, adequate tidal volumes. It's not a textbook. It's not a, every patient on the bench gets four mLs per kilo, six mLs per kilo. Do studies support that? Sure. But does studies support every, is every study applicable to every single patient? No. So if you have a patient who six mLs per kilo is giving you a bird beak on your pressure volume loop, then you're overextending that patient and you need to make an adjustment. Okay. On the flip side, if your patient has, has areas of hypoventilation, which is harder to detect because we just look at a blood gas, and if everything looks good on that, it's harder to detect regional areas of hypoventilation. You just have to ask yourself, if your tidal volume is supposed to be 370 to, to, to 490, and we have them on 350, are we, is the result of this going to be some level of regional hypoventilation that could lead to vasoconstriction? Okay, now back to compression. Overstretching of the alveoli will further compress the pulmonary capillaries, lead to pulmonary hypertension. Excessively high PEEP will overstretch alveoli, compress pulmonary capillaries, increase pulmonary hypertension. Okay, now that's my three theories on why this doc would say that all patients on mechanical ventilators um, have some level of pulmonary hypertension. Now, Maria, what I would like for you to do is to take these theories back to him and ask him for which of these explains his reasoning. And if it's something other than this, I would love to hear it. 
Because um, when you just break down theories of the circulatory system and you apply it to theories of mechanical ventilation and you blend those two, okay, this is the, 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 the only thing that can make sense in supporting that. Okay, now your second question was which mode of mechanical ventilation will be at a greater risk of causing pulmonary hypertension? Well, the answer to that is there isn't one single mode. The answer to that is, is any mode that increases positive pressure excessively. So the higher your mean airway pressure, the higher your peak, the higher your peak pressures, the higher chance your patient is of having these pulmonary vessels compressed which will give you a higher risk of pulmonary hypertension. You may have a patient on volume ventilation with a really high peak and tidal volumes that are a little too much for them, and they may experience a greater level of pulmonary vasoconstriction than somebody on APRV, okay, or, or, or pressure control. Just depends on the setting. So I think the, the answer to that question comes into understanding Plateau pressures, um, mean airway pressures, and and peak pressures, and understanding how to 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 get where you need to be for your patients without applying too much positive pressure, which will lead and increase your risk for this. Okay, Maria, I hope this helps. Anybody else watching this, I hope it makes sense. If it doesn't, please leave me a comment. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. You can do that simply by pushing this button over here, and please check out my next video. Thanks for asking.